At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. As always, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast, or if this is your first time joining us, to give you an especially warm welcome. The next 30 minutes or so, we are going to cover a whole bunch of information about cannabis. And if you have a love of the cannabis plant like I do, you've come to the right place. Appropriately inspired for today's show, uh, we are going to get further inspired later on. And in fact, the cultivar corner this week is an indica from the, the East Coast. Of course, we are on the West Coast, BC Bud, the home of BC Bud. And it has been making a lot of noise in our store lately. And that is from Highland Grow in Nova Scotia. And we're going to be sampling Eastern Dank later on, but I didn't want to do that before I started the whole podcast because it is a fairly heavy indica, and uh, sometimes that can put me to bed a little earlier than I want. So <laughs> I thought it best to do the Cultivar Corner, actually, after most of the other podcast has been recorded. So that's kind of the situation where we're in today. Here we are. This, believe it or not, is the penultimate episode for Season 2 of the Cannabis Podcast. It was two years ago, December 1st this year, that when we started the first episode of the Cannabis Podcast, been doing it well, as you know, we started out on a weekly basis after that, and then I quickly realized I didn't have time to do the weekly thing, so we flipped to a bi-weekly, kind of kept that up, and here we are at episode 58 this week at almost two years, so two more episodes in season number two, including this one. We're still in a weird kind of time. COVID-19 cases are increasing all across our country, including here in the BC area. More areas are coming under various levels of lockdown. Certain health regions in this province have been locked down for the next two weeks where you're not supposed to have any interactions with anybody outside of your household. It's just a weird, weird time, isn't it? But it, it's times like this when we remember how essential cannabis is to get us through times like this. They are an essential service, so even if everything does get locked down, I suspect the cannabis stores will still continue to be open. Speaking of cannabis stores, the one I work at, Spirit Leaf in Kelowna, has been open now for over six months. Well, actually, that's not true. When this episode airs, it will be almost exactly six months. The 15th of November marks six months for the store. Loving the ride and uh, fantastic to have the experience of being able to work pretty close to my home. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. I'm going to talk about an experience I had just in this last week or two where I got to use some cannabis-infused oil to create a delicious meal. I'll tell you where that idea came from. Also... We are going to talk about, you've heard me talk about before, where I've had some plants stolen the last couple of harvests, two years ago, uh, in fact, two years in a row. I was pleased to see a story from Ontario. It's a tiny little story, but somebody got ripped off and the police actually took action. So I'll tell you about that. And as well, we're going to visit Mr. Stinky's Garden, who we've talked to before. We visited their site before. And I'm going to look at an article they've developed on why edibles last so long. Why does that high last so long? Plus, a story about a local success that has gone global, the folks at Valens. And then, as I previously mentioned on Cultivar Corner, we're going to head to the East Coast for a taste of Highland Grow's Eastern Tank. All of that and more is coming your way on Episode 58 of the Cannabis Podcast. So one thing I got to do just over the last couple of weeks was to make a cannabis-infused meal. I hadn't really played around a lot like that before. We, of course, have spoken with Marge from the Bite Me podcast, who kind of got me interested in doing some cannabis infusion into my various meals. And this was a, an item that came up, actually, from working at the store. It was an arrangement between the Nomad Cook. And if you go to the nomadcook.ca, you'll take a peek at Travis Peterson. Travis is a chef, and he hires himself out to do cannabis-infused meals. So... He got together with the folks at Simply Bear. Rubicon Organics is their parent company. They are down in Delta in BC, growing some fine, fine cannabis, all organically grown, organically certified. Simply Bear and Travis got together to put on this little uh, display for some of us in the Spirit Leaf world. And it was a couple of nights. The first night we did infusion, 
we created our infusion of the Simply Bear Sour Cookies. Mmm, what a delightful uh, cultivar that is. Uh, really nice notes of, of sweet and sour in there, which is why we used it. It paired very nicely, the chirpings did, with a sweet and sour chicken. And that was the meal that we ended up cooking. So it was quite a good experience. I, I had fun doing it. As I say, the first day uh, was about an hour, but really we only took about half an hour and then everything had to do cook by itself. And that was creating the infusion. The co And we used coconut oil, a cup of coconut oil to three and a half grams of sour, uh, Simply Bear sour cookies, uh, cut up, not ground, but cut up, kind of like you would cut up a vegetable. And then I used a slow cooker to, uh, to create mine and uh, put it on high for a little bit. And the interesting thing I, I found... Uh, what the Travis's approach was, uh, is he added into that because, again, we're going for the taste, the, the pairing taste when we're putting into a meal. So we didn't just use coconut oil, but that coconut oil had some lemongrass and it had some ginger in it too. And started that on high in the slow cooker, did that for about 30 minutes, and then dropped that down to low and just let that sucker cook for another two and a half hours, infusing all that delicious cannabis uh, into that coconut oil, now, it was, de or was not decarboxylated cannabis. Travis does this for a reason. He doesn't want the highs from the meals to be too, too heavy. Uh, too much of a, of a mind high, I guess. So intentionally using a not decarboxylated cannabis and came up with a formula after that infusion that we could figure out kind of a guess as to, well, not really a guess, but, <laughs> but more, more than a guess, to determine exactly how potent the derivative that you're creating is. And through that formula, it came out that I should have had in each tablespoon, based on the formula and what we did, there should have been about 25, 26 milligrams of THC in each tablespoon. So as I was preparing the meal and uh, my wife, who, by the way, uh, turned 65 years old uh, just a couple of days before this podcast came out. I don't often talk about things in my personal life, but I've got to talk about that because, I mean, uh, she's been the love of my life and, and she's reached a milestone birthday. So cooking this meal, uh, she didn't want to have any of the THC infused in it because she has found that edibles don't work too well for her. So I set it up intentionally so that she had the I, I guess the virgin sweet and sour chicken uh, with lemongrass, uh, jasmine rice was the sidebar to that. And so then I added the infused portion only to my meal and estimated to gain 26 milligrams per tablespoon, added two tablespoons of that. And I'd like to report <laughs> that I got really, really buzzed on that because I would guesstimate that that's probably should be a pretty good dose for me, roughly 50 milligrams. Now, again, the questions that haven't been answered, how, how effective was the infusion, how much of that THC did get decarboxylated through the process, all of those various variables. But after a couple of hours of, after the meal, I kind of sat down and realized it was time to smoke a joint because I'm not really feeling a whole lot. So once more, my experimentation with edibles has failed to give me a, a real wild or a really good high that I that I appreciate every moment of. And I, I'm i not sure if I'm done <laughs> experimenting with it yet. I'm getting pretty close because uh, it's been pretty frustrating that every time you try it, you never get that. You never get to that level of, of goodness that you're seeking. So there you go. There was my experience with uh, cooking with Simply Bear sour cookies, a wonderful cultivar. I really love the taste. And I love so much of what Simply Bear is doing. And a shout out to Travis Peterson, the nomad cook for all of his help and assistance. And I'll reference his website. You can check it out for yourself and maybe uh, invite him over to cook you a cannabis-infused meal. It'd be absolutely delicious, I'm sure. But for me, <laughs> it seems that uh, cannabis and edibles just do not get that bang that I'm looking for. From the Cannabis-Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. So I mentioned a couple of times on the podcast, uh, through our process of growing, that we had the unfortunate aspect of having some stuff ripped off. And it happened literally two years in a row. It was both the same plants, because in both cases, uh, most of the indica had been harvested, but we still had one sativa left in the back part of the garden. 
and I was waiting for the trichomes to to reach that beautiful amber state and get to about 80% amber. Well, <laughs> in both times, of course, that failed because the damn plants got ripped off. So this is a very short story, but I was really pleased to see this one. And this is a story from Global BC, uh, globalnews.ca. Two Lindsay, Ontario residents face theft charges following an investigation into the reported theft of a cannabis plant last October. According to the City of Kawartha Lakes Police Service, on October 8th, a Lindsay resident reported his cannabis plant was stolen from his backyard. The complainant provided police with video surveillance from his home, which showed a man and woman stealing the plant. Police identify the suspects who were arrested on Saturday. Jason Giroux, 41, and Pamela Shorey, 39, of Lindsay, were each charged with theft under $5,000 and possession of property obtained by crime under $5,000. They were released and will appear in court in Lindsay on January 7th of 2021, police stated on Monday. And you have no idea how good that makes me feel. And the operative piece is in that middle paragraph where it said the complainant provided police with video surveillance from his home. Because, of course, each time that we got ripped off, we did call the RCMP and reported it as a theft. And each time they asked if we had video surveillance, and we said, unfortunately, no. Now we have video surveillance, and fortunately, nobody is ripping off our plants anymore. Because, as I've already talked about on this episode, or on the uh, this year's, this season of the Cannabis Podcast, we went auto flowers this year, and our harvest was done way back in August. So if anybody does climb over the fence in the next couple of days... <laughs> and is looking for some cannabis, they are going to be sorely disappointed because there's none for them to steal. Now, this was another story I found really interesting in relation to the fact that we are two years into legalization, as noticed by the fact that this podcast is almost at two years of existence. And this was a story from a local website called Castanet, about legalization in Kelowna residents still facing cannabis charges. The legalization of cannabis in 2018 meant that the hundreds of cannabis possession charges Kelowna residents faced every year were no longer laid, but locals and those across the country are still facing cannabis-related charges. New crime data released by Statistics Canada this week shows more than 18,000 Cannabis Act infractions were reported by police across Canada in the first 14 months after the October 2018 legalization. The police-reported crime data refers to incidents where charges were laid by police or recommended to the Crown in B.C. and Quebec and don't necessarily mean a person was convicted. Of these 18,000 Cannabis Act incidents, more than 2,300 were related to the possession of cannabis. Under the Cannabis Act, possession of more than 30 grams in a public place remains illegal, as is possession of illicit cannabis. I always found that weird, too. Like, <laughs> I guess if it's not in a legal bag, it's considered illicit cannabis. It also remains illegal to possess more than four cannabis plants or possess a budding or flowering cannabis plant in public. Not that anybody would walk down the street with a budding cannabis plant, but anyway. <laughs> in the Kelowna Census metropolitan area, which includes Lake Country, West Kelowna, West Bank, First Nation, and Peachland, nine people were charged with possessing more than 30 grams over those first 14 months while two people were charged with possession of more than four plants or a budding flowering plant in public. I find that absolutely astounding. Despite legalization, possession of cannabis under the new framework can carry a maximum penalty of up to five years in jail. In the 10 months of 2018 before the Cannabis Act came into effect, 314 people were charged with possession of cannabis in and around Kelowna, while 458 were charged in 2017. While 11 people in and around Kelowna were charged with trafficking cannabis in the first 10 months of 2018, pre-legalization, four people in the area were charged with possession of cannabis for the purpose of distributing in the 14 months after legalization. Under the new framework, it remains illegal to distribute more than 30 grams of cannabis. A person convicted of distribution or possession for the purpose of distribution can face a maximum prison term of 14 years. Ouch! Selling any amount of cannabis outside the legal framework also carries a 14-year maximum sentence. Police reported just one instance of a person selling cannabis in or around Kelowna in 2019. And of course, we know that in the black market, there's still a lot of that going around. Additionally, police reported six cases in or around Kelowna in 2019 where a person had cultivated an illicit cannabis plant or grew more than four plants at a time. 
This also carries a maximum 14-year imprisonment upon conviction. My goodness, 14 years for growing a plant, which <laughs> I thought we moved, accomplished so much legalization. This story is depressing me a little bit. In 2017, police reported 18 instances of the production of cannabis in and around Kelowna. Across B.C., one of the more prevalent Cannabis Act infractions in 2019 was the importation and exportation of cannabis. In 2019, police in B.C. reported 2,474 cases of the importation and exportation of cannabis, but just two of the cases came from the Kelowna area. Meanwhile, the Kelowna Central Market area had the highest rate of police-reported opioid-related offenses of anywhere in Canada in 2019 at 124 incidents per 100,000 people. And that is a discussion for another point, the whole opioid crisis that's happening in our province and across our country. Oh. So there you go. Uh, despite the fact that legalization occurred many, many months ago, there's still a lot of people getting busted for various cannabis offenses, and that really actually surprises me just a little bit. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. All right. And it's time now to head back to Mr. Stinky's Green Garden. We visited this website before and appreciate uh, what they put out. And this time, kind of following on my discussion about edibles earlier, I wanted to touch on just a little bit more of the detail of why edibles are such a different high and why it lasts so much longer. So this is a story from our friends at Mr. Stinky's Garden. If you have ever dabbed in medicated foods, then you know the edible high can be intense and long-lasting. If it works for you, that is. <laughs> Sorry for that sidebar. Definitely much more so than smoked or vaporized flour. Luckily, regulations in many legalized states are setting upper limits on the potency of edibles and the way they are proportioned and packaged. But there's still a huge learning curve for consumers of edibles when it comes to dosage control and an enjoyable, well-timed edible high. And of course, here in Canada, Health Canada still has to adjust their edible dosage limits. Uh, that's the biggest thing that we get from people coming into the store who want, obviously, much higher dosages. I've done edibles from the gray markets and the black market for a number of years, and those edible dosages are 30, 40, 50 milligrams instead of the 10 milligrams per package that Health Canada limits. So back to the story. When it comes to how the body breaks down THC, inhalation and ingestion differ greatly. And this is a fact that people have to remember with edibles. You simply have to know this if you want to take control of your consumption and the effects you feel. When you smoke or vaporize cannabis, it enters the bloodstream directly through vessels within the lungs. And there's no need for the THC to pass through the digestive system. This means the effects will hit you almost immediately, roughly three to five minutes, and will usually subsidize in the span of four to six hours. I wish. I cannot honestly think the last time I had a, a, a smoking inhalation <laughs> induced high that lasted me six hours. Wow. I want to get some of your pot. <laughs> Imbibing an edible is a whole different story, however. In this case, THC moves through the entire digestive system. This means there are many metabolic factors that contribute to the way you feel after consuming. THC from ingested cannabis is slowly processed through the mouth, stomach, intestines, and finally the liver, where it eventually does make it into your bloodstream. However, the resulting effects depend on many factors that are so often overlooked by new or inexperienced users. Taking an edible while dehydrated or on an empty stomach will likely cause the THC to hit your system all at once, making you incredibly high. On the contrary, eating THC after you've already eaten a meal will generally cause a delay in the edible's metabolism. That means you might not feel high for a few hours, and the strong effect can last as long as it takes for your food to break down completely. Depending on the natural speed of your metabolism, it could be a while until the effects of an edible go away. During this time, you might have some serious trouble tending to your daily routine or even staying awake. The length and intensity of your edible high can also be affected by prescription medications or supplements that you're on. That's why it's always a good idea to chat with your doctor about how your metabolism could be affected. And another reason the edible high lasts so long is because the body creates different THC byproducts based on the method of consumption. And of course, simply put, that means that when we are inhaling cannabis, it's delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, and when we have digestion through the liver, it transforms it to 11-hydroxy tetrahydrocannabinol, a completely different molecule of THC. 
six times stronger and the operating factor, which I always remind people, way more unpredictable. And it is that unpredictability which causes such weird effects with edibles, as evidenced by the fact that, again, I did what should have been 50 milligrams of THC, should have been a decent dosage, and yet I don't think I felt any high at all. So if you have some experience with edibles and you don't really understand why, well, perhaps now you have a better understanding of how that impacts you. And it comes down to, again, the phrase, consumption determines effect. And one thing that I wanted to touch on before we get into Cultivar Corner is just to congratulate a local company that is doing fabulous. And this is taking a bit of their press release that came out just a little while ago. The company is Valens. Uh, Valens is doing a lot of extraction and is creating for a number of different companies, doing their extraction and filling their various uh, tips for all of their vape pens. So fabulous that they're, they're doing so well. And they just signed a deal in Australia with wholesale licenses, Valence Australia is permitted to provide premium derivative products containing cannabidiol, CBD, and or tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, directly to the medicinal cannabis market in Australia. The two wholesale licenses remain active for one year, after which they are eligible for renewal. I chatted with a buddy who I used to work with a couple of years ago, who went off to work at Valence, still there, still working in the extraction field and really having a blast and loving how the company is expanding and kudos to the company. Uh, they are just growing heads and shoulders. And a number of the companies uh, that we have the vape tips for, uh, they are being filled by Valence. So it's always nice to see a local company doing so well. And Valence is certainly one of those local companies. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo coming this May 12 to 15 to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lyft Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lyft & Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. And on Cultivar Corner today, we are taking a trip all the way across the country. Of course, this podcast originates in the Okanagan Valley of British Columbia, Lots of BC bud around. We've uh, talked about a lot of BC bud since we started a couple of years ago. I think it's time we take a trip all the way over to Nova Scotia to look in at a company called Highland Grow. And I love their line, from our coast to yours. Highland Grow is a Nova Scotia grower, and we've had a number of their cultivars in the store. Uh, very popular, I must say, because they're pretty darn good. Uh, they have White Lightning, they have Gaelic Fire, Cherry Burst, Sensi Wizard, Animal Crusher, and the one we're going to look at today, and that is Eastern Dank. Gotta love a name like that, don't you? You just know as soon as you open that, it's just going to be Dank. <laughs> and in fact, today, we're going back to the original start of Cultivar Corner, where we open the container as part of the event. And so here is Eastern Dank from Highland Grow, as I open the package. And as an interesting, before I actually pop the package, uh, we, of course, sell houseplant product as well. And we actually had a Zoom session with Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogan. This was a week or two ago. I had a chat with all of these stores in British Columbia. It was a very cool call. Uh, everybody was well behaved. Nobody was being goofy about it. And I asked Seth about whether they were going to be looking at different packaging from Houseplant. In fact, I talked about the envelope packaging, which many of our customers prefer. And his response was he didn't like his weed to get beat up in an envelope package, so they doubted that they would start using those. But we are seeing a lot of companies go this way. And in fact, I've had probably two or three guests now who have chosen their weed based on the packaging, and they're looking for these little envelopes. So here is Eastern Dank from Highland Grow. Let's pop it. Ah. Oh, ho, ho. Oh, that is really dank. Now let me pop a butt out of there and take a peek at it. Mmm. Oh, really lovely odor. Um, so far I'm impressed. So Eastern Dank 
is a high THC indica strain that, uh, or cultivar, let's call it the right thing, please, <laughs> that presents a dank scent. Oh, yeah, I would agree with that. With a scent that, uh, or rather with a smoke that tastes earthy, woody, and sour. So chances are there's going to be some sour kush show. In fact, they even show the genetics. I love that. Genetics of Eastern Dank, G13 uh, plus Purple Kush. And even better, oh, I'm really liking Highland Grove because they also show the terpene profile. And the terpene profile for Eastern Dank, Myrcene, Pinene, and beta caryophylline mm. And based on my history, all three of those terpenes are right in my wheelhouse. I love cannabis with those, especially those three in combination. Mm, myrcene appears to be the most dominant, not surprising since it is an indica. <sighs> okay, that's enough smelling. <laughs> I got to get to work. I got to roll a joint, get some ready in my vaporizer uh, to have a puff. So uh, we'll be back. Ooh, this is really sweet and dank. And as I break up those buds to get it ready for the joint, oh, oh it, it just a whole bunch more odor just erupted from it. Mmm, that is a pretty dank scent. Dank scent. I, th I think they've named this one appropriate. I made a slight modification to my CFX Boundless. The only thing I didn't really like is it didn't really have a big, heavy draw. So I actually used a part from my Mighty and have put that in place, and it means I get a bit more draw out of it. Well, I'm kind of happy about that. The vaporizer warms up, and while it does, it's time to light this joint of Eastern Dank. And by the way, the other components of it, the THC range is from 20 to 24%. And the particular lot I got, 22.6%. CBD, negligible, less than uh, 0 0.2 milligrams of CBD. Here we go. Eastern Dank from Highland Grow. Oh. <clears throat> Almost little rock star taste with that first inhale there. Likely some similarity in terpene profiles. <clears throat> Definitely earthy. And and that woody from the, the pinene, the earthiness from the myrcene. And throw in a little bit of sour. Mm. And there's my third hit from the joint. And I've been looking for a really nice indica. I've, I've sampled many. I think we've we've sampled many of them here on the Cannabis Podcast. And that's the way I really like to end my evenings. Mm. There they are. Mm. The happy eyes have returned. But happy eyes with a with a bit of, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Just a, a kind of laid back happy eyes. I guess that would be how I would describe it. Oh, a real burst of euphoria. Just, just suddenly everything just seems so wonderfully beautiful. Hmm. Oh, like that. Okay. So that's a few hits off of the joint, which has clearly given me a a feel for what the intensity of Eastern Dank is. Now I really want to get a real feel for the taste. So here we go to the vaporizer. Mmm. Oh, and there you get it. So much more taste. And that modification I did gives me so much more, packs so much more punch now. Mmm, definitely earthy. And I always taste that when there's myrcene involved. The woodiness, I gotta think, comes from the pinene. Mmm. So you gotta cross a G13 and purple kush becomes eastern dank when Highland Grow gets it in their greenhouse. Mmm. I think we got a very good night in store for us. Another recommendation for another good high, nice taste. 
smooth in both the joints and in the vaporizer. Uh, lots of white ash on the joints, nothing black coming out on there, no harshness. I'm not feeling a lot of harshness in my throat in either way of inhalation. So, yeah, well, I'm going to be looking at some more product from Highland Grow. We'll have to check out some of their sativas as well. So there you go. Eastern Dank from Highland Grow definitely wins the award for dankness. As always, if you want to explore any of the stuff that was talked about today, the links have been posted back at CannabisPodcast.com. Always looking to hear from you, info at CannabisPodcast.com if you have a message that you would like to send. Always like to hear from you. Uh, and a shout out to Marge. Uh, it's already referenced her earlier in the episode, the host of the Bite Me podcast. Had a little bit more communication with Marge and encourage you to tune in to her podcast as well. And that, ladies and gentlemen, wraps it up for the penultimate episode of season number two of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Podcast.